The year was 1938, and National Publications was downright desperate for features to publish in its new anthology series called Action Comics. Two high school friends from Cleveland had also become pretty desperate. They'd been pitching their idea for a comic strip called Superman to different publications, and everyone had turned them down. Back in 1933, writer Jerry Siegel and illustrator Joe Schuster had published a short story called The Reign of the Superman. Side note, the dash in the title was only there because the name was printed across two pages. The name was spelled Superman as one word, so now with that one guy who always says, <laughs> well, actually, tries to tell you that it was originally spelled with a dash, you can put him in his place. Anyway, the story was published in January of 1933 in the third issue of the duo's own fan magazine called Science Fiction, The Advanced Guard of Future Civilization. The titular character was a telepathic villain who had more of Lex Luthor about him than of Superman. And so they reworked this story into a comic strip about a hero that could leap one-eighth of a mile, outrun a speeding train, and lift heavy stuff. And that brings us full circle back to 1938 when an editor who had passed on the comic recommended it to national publications. This required the duo to cut and paste their comic strip into a 13-page comic book story. It became the lead feature in Action Comics No. 1, changing both the comic industry and the world forever. Superman went on to sell millions of books every month, and every publisher began scrambling to put out their own superhero stories. Siegel and Schuster, two teens trying to escape Depression-era poverty by breaking into the comics industry, were now famous creators, but they'd also developed resentment toward the company that bought the rights to Superman from them for only $130. Now, to be fair, this comes to an estimated $2,257 when adjusted for inflation, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and its CPI inflation calculator. However, two grand is still a far cry from the millions that National Publications was bringing in off the success of Superman. In 1947, they sued National over the rights to Superman, and they lost. The company responded by firing the duo and removing their created buy credit. Decades later, in 1975, the pending release of Superman the Movie starring Christopher Reeve stirred up a controversy over the duo's treatment, and in response, they were given a lifetime stipend, medical benefits, and a credit going forward. During the golden age of comics, Superman battled it out with gangsters and criminals, unlike the supervillains and alien forces that would come in later years. For much of this era, creators Siegel and Schuster were still on staff at National Publications, which was already known as DC Comics as early as 1940. However, other artists and writers were becoming increasingly involved in telling stories about the Man of Steel. In 1954, the Comics Code Authority was established to protect children from the evils of comic books. Superman changed with the times, and within a couple of years, the Silver Age of Comics was underway. Comic book storylines became silly and campy, and while the Golden Age had its fair share of campy goodness, the Silver Age was different in that the silly was all you got. Superman's increase in powers and abilities had been going on throughout the Golden Age, but accelerated during this time. At times, Superman's had telekinesis, telepathy, hypnotism, and super ventriloquism. Side note, the start and end date of most of these eras are debatable, as these types of changes happen gradually. How many ages there are, what they're called, and when they begin or end, it's always been debatable. One school of thought places the end of the Silver Age as happening around 1985 when the DC Universe rebooted with a story arc called Crisis on Infinite Earths. However, this school of thought leaves out the Bronze Age entirely, which is often said to have started in 1970 when Jack Kirby left Marvel to work for DC. 
Likewise, the modern age is often said to have begun around 1986, a year after Crisis, and the same year DC Comics released Watchmen and Batman The Dark Knight Returns, both written by comic book legend Alan Moore. For our purposes, we're skipping ahead to 1992 with Superman Volume 2, Issue 75, The Death of Superman. By this time, the newly rebooted versions of Clark Kent and Lois Lane had been dating and the two lovebirds were engaged in Superman No. 50. The team that had been writing the story arc had planned a huge wedding and wanted the couple to tie the knot around Issue 75. Unfortunately for our mild-mannered reporter, Warner Brothers, which owned DC Comics by this time, had plans of their own. They wanted to do a new TV series based on these two lovebirds and were worried that having them married in the comics would kill the will-they-won't-they -they vibe in the show. So what's the writer's room to do? They needed a big event that they could pull off in issue 75 to replace the wedding. Now, I'm not sure how they came up with the idea to kill off Superman as a replacement for his marriage, but I like to imagine that they were engaged in a game of fuck, marry, kill when one of them suddenly jumped up and yelled, I've got it! But now we're all caught up to 1992's The Death of Superman, and I'd like to tell you guys the story. Now, I'm no Benny, and I don't intend to do this often, but I'll try to do the material justice. The story begins with Doomsday, a monster bound in green leather with bone protrusions all over his body. He punches through the wall of the prison he's contained in and jumps to freedom. Traveling through the forest, knocking down the trees, he eventually finds civilization and proceeds to wreck a bridge filled with cars. Booster Gold and Maxima are the first responders from the Justice League, and along with Guy Gardner and Tora, they get to work saving civilians and putting out fires. Bloodwing gathers a group into Blue Beetle's Flying Beetle, and they head out looking for whoever or whatever caused this devastation. However, the group gets too close too fast, and Doomsday sees them first. He throws a tree at the Flying Beetle, and its destruction sends everyone flying. And by the time everyone is safe on the ground, Doomsday is long gone. Our heroes give chase and they find Doomsday on a street, destroying every car in his path. Gardner jumps in, but Doomsday catches him by the head and puts him down. He never had a chance. Fire uses the full force of her abilities on Doomsday, but it doesn't even phase him. Doomsday grabs Blue Beetle by the throat and starts ramming his head into anything and everything as Beetle literally begs for someone to help him. Booster Gold angrily storms into the fight, but Doomsday punches him so hard that it sends him flying through the sky, where he's caught by Superman. The Man of Steel has arrived. Superman lands with Booster Gold just as Doomsday throws Tora through a house. The Man of Steel steps up to Doomsday and takes the full power of his punch and doesn't even flinch. But Doomsday kicks him and Superman goes flying through the house and into a tree. As the Justice League regroups, the remaining heroes attack with all their might at the same time, but it's no good. This entire time, Doomsday has had a hand literally tied behind his back, presumably from back at the prison. All they've done is set the hand free for him. Doomsday laughs. He throws Superman and grabs Booster Gold by the throat. As Doomsday throws Booster, Superman and Bloodwing attack from two fronts, but it's still no good. Doomsday punches them both at once and he jumps to freedom. Superman won't give up though. He gives chase and flying at top speed, he catches up to Doomsday and they begin to battle it out. The battle rages on and on and eventually the two end up making their way back to Metropolis. Superman tries to fly Doomsday into space and away from the city, away from the civilians, but Doomsday knocks the breath out of the Man of Steel and they land in the middle of a construction site. Superman realizes this could be it and gives Lois Lane what could be their final kiss. He tells her that he loves her and he flies into battle to put Doomsday down for good. Doomsday's bone protrusions are so sharp that they actually cut the Man of Steel and he begins to bleed. While the two continue to battle it out, Superman starts to break off the sharp bone protrusions that stick out of Doomsday's body. 
and after a long, hard-fought battle, Superman lays on the ground, bleeding. In his last dying breath, he whispers to Lois, Doomsday, is he? You stopped him, she replies. You saved us all. Sadly, this was the time Superman didn't make it back. Superman's had many changes and revamps over the years. Two poor teenagers in the Depression era went looking for the American dream, and in finding it, they captured the imagination of fans, writers, artists, and society as a whole. The public has maintained that interest and enthusiasm for nearly nine decades, from the Golden Age strongman to the silly Silver Age hero and into the modern mainstream, Superman really is an icon. It's an idea that will outlast us all. Thank you, fancy nerds, so much for watching. I know this was a long video and it breaks a lot of new ground for this channel, but I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give this video a like and share it on Facebook and Twitter. It helps the channel so much. The names on the screen right now are the channel's lovely patrons from Patreon who make my fancy pants editing software possible. Thank you guys, and I'll see most of you in the Patreon Google Hangout this weekend. I want to thank T-Blocks for sponsoring such a small channel. Again, that promo code is FancyTeethTVX, and the website is tblocks.com. Turn on notifications if you want to be notified when the next video comes out, and it will be discussing the symbolism and philosophy of Superman. But most importantly, thank every single one of you for watching. I've been Jay Parks.